you're not making any money and you're working 10 hour days, you know, doing uh, dehumanizing work and you have to even hang out with these people after work and, you know, you, you don't see your family, you don't see anybody that you know. So it just very clearly became, this is not worth it, you know. Okay, Amani, you worked for a Credico subsidiary out of uh, Times Square in New right. York City. And your situation is a little bit unique, but we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, but the impression that I got when you messaged us initially was that you wanted to name names. Like you had no problem identifying what companies you were, you either worked at or knew about and also uh, naming specific people. Right. And you gave us an address, uh, which upon further research, I have found many people are aware that yeah. this is going yeah, on this yeah. address. 690, 690 8th Avenue in Times Square, New York City. So can you tell us a little bit about what you know um, that goes on there and provide whatever information you'd like? Yeah, so I'm in... From, from my research now, you know, after the fact, I've, I've kind of figured out that there's a lot of these companies, a lot of the critical companies that are operating all out of the same office. You know, they're, I think the building, when I looked it up, is owned by Raf Diaz, who is kind of infamous in this whole Credico thing. And, you know, I worked for one particular um, company called uh, it's, it's Your Wheelhouse, but there were, you know, at least five or six other, you know, replicant type of companies doing different campaigns and, um, you know, going out into the field and selling different kinds of products, but they were all uh, housed in this one building. And, you know, maybe, you know, looking back on it now should have been a little bit more skeptical because uh, if you've been to New York, you know that uh, anything that is going on in the heart of Times Square, you know, maybe it's not always the, the, the most ethical business or the, the healthiest thing to get involved with. So you mentioned uh, one name you mentioned, Raf Diaz. Yeah, which, which like you said, uh, anyone who's familiar at all with Credit Code, they're right. familiar with the Diaz's, Raf and, and Elena. Yeah. yeah, his wife, yeah. So you said that you found out that the building itself is being owned or, or rented out by, by Raf Diaz. How did you come across that information? I, I, I wish I could um, refine the link again when I tried to find it, you know, today. But before, you know, after my whole experience, I was really kind of going in deep, just um, really kind of shocked about this whole thing. You know, what is this? And I was able to, to find like... Um, a registry website basically for buildings in New York. And I saw that uh, his name was on it. And um, the, the parent company, you know how these like, the little companies have like a parent company and the one for mine was called Market Value Incorporated. And then I also saw that he was uh, the head of that as well. Okay, yeah, for anyone who wants to do research, uh, the, the trail is, is, is very clear. Yeah. And uh, while I was doing research, I did look up Market Value Incorporated, and yeah, like you said, you can find Raf Diaz's photo on that website as far and as well as the uh, the company which you worked for, which yeah. you said was it's your wheelhouse. If you do a little bit of research, two years ago there was a Reddit post. It was it's titled "NYC Job Seekers Beware Pyramid Scheme at 698th Avenue," which is exactly where we're talking about here, and some of the names that it mentions: Allure Marketing Group. WG, WUG marketing, which you also mentioned. Uh, identified yeah, I think in your that message. was the, I think that was the company, you know, how they change their names all the time. I think yeah. that was the one before it's your wheelhouse because um, a lot of the same people who, who I worked with, you know, were, were working with them before. Sure. And I, I, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. And what's interesting, and you also mentioned Market Value Incorporated. One of the interesting things I found about that is that they, seem to have either moved or, well, according to their Facebook page, they've expanded, but I don't uh, know if I believe that. Right. You can never, they, they play so many language games. You, you can never know for sure. Yeah. Their Facebook page, they still have the address for the eighth Avenue location in New York city, but their, as their website does too, but their phone number is a Houston phone number. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I did notice that too. Which the, one of the last videos they posted says something about their move to Houston. 
Hmm. And I don't know if they meant to put that in as move to Houston because previously it was expanding to Houston. I don't know. Hmm. But if you go to LinkedIn and look up Market Value Inc., it is out of Houston. Interesting. So once again, we don't know. It's, it's all smoke and mirrors with these yeah, companies. You yeah. know, there could be, like you said, four or five, if not more, at the same address, which we've heard in other videos as well. Uh, the same people. So we've got Roth Diaz uh, in multiple, in photos from multiple offices, but that should make sense. If these are credit go companies, you're going to encounter Roth and Elena Diaz. They are. Right. That's what it seems days. like. Yeah. The, uh, the more I do my research, the more I see, you know, he's, um, you know, connected to everybody, you know, all of the people that I worked with when I looked them up, you know, they all have photos with him and, and that, that sort of thing. So, and I guess more specifically with that exact address, you know, if you get an email or, or when they try to, you know, bring you in, for every single company, you know, all five or six or possibly more that are in that building, they tell you to go to the fifth floor. And, and it's like a, it's a very small like office and, you know, a couple of rooms in there. But, you know, all of these companies are supposed to be you know, operating out of the mm -hmm. fifth floor. And, and I think this is important, too, because anyone who, who watches these videos or has any background in the business knows that these names are probably going to change. Yeah. So, uh, you know who know whenever you're seeing this video whether it is 2021 or years afterwards the names might change but the address might not you know because like you said if if Raf Diaz does in fact own this building really the whole purpose of him owning that building is to have owners open their office in that building yeah. so i mean it makes sense that even after the fact now you brought up another name as well who was your specific owner manager correct yeah. but Said that you also found him just like the Diaz's. He is also on Devil Corp, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he wasn't um, like my specific um, owner manager during the interview process, but he was the the head of Wheelhouse. You know, he was the the head of the the entire office. But yeah, uh, Andres Ospina. Yeah, I found him on the Devil Corp as well. He has a picture there, and yeah. But but I I only had a limited interaction with him during the first interview you know when they bring you in for the five minute conversation and and things like that i would see him around the office you got involved in this but what's really interesting about your story specifically is that you were only there for a week and a half yeah and yeah, I'll yeah. I, I, and i think a lot of people have done it could be like jobs or it could be something else for a week and a half and they'll just forget about it. They'll just chalk yeah. it up to whatever that didn't work out. But that must have left an impression on you to reach out to us and be one of these very brave lineup of people who share their stories, even though going into this, you're, you know, well, I, I probably don't have that much to offer from experience of being there, but you obviously learned a lot. So what made you so interested and passionate about wanting to share your story, even though you were there for just a tiny, tiny amount of time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, I don't have the, the same experience. You know, I've seen all of these videos and people there for, for months or years. And, you know, I, I can't re relate to that at all. You know, that's a that's a totally different thing. But I don't know, I wanted to talk about it. Because, you know, maybe I could talk about the the beginning process, you know, when you first start and, you know, seeing the red flags, and, you know, kind of do I go with my intuition, but I need a job, you know, that kind of whole thing, because that's really what sticks in my memory for what I was feeling and, you know, what I was going through trying to navigate uh, this very, you know, strange opportunity that I, I kind of stumbled into. Mm -hmm. So you knew, I mean, you had to, from the beginning, essentially, you noticed things were a little off. You noticed, like you said, red flags, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I can kind of um, maybe like walk you through the beginning and kind of point out some of the red flags and that'll kind of walk you through what I was thinking. So I, well, I graduated college in, in 2020, you know, right as the pandemic was starting. So kind of a difficult time to find a job, just, you know, the whole world kind of turned up upside down. And, but thankfully I was able to, you know, find a, a tutoring job. So I'd go over to this family and like tutor their uh, elementary school kid on his Zoom classes. But, you know, eventually the, the schools reopened in New York so it was like very fast that ended. And, you know, I need, a, need to pay my rent, you know, need a job, that kind of thing. So I start applying to a bunch of different jobs. And, you know, of course I hear back from, from this one, 
And the, the job title was like entry level marketing rep or something like that. And I don't have uh, experience in marketing. You know, I didn't go to, to school for marketing or anything like that. But um, my parents have some background in marketing, you know, real actual uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, um, entry level, I can try this out. I need a job, you know, why not? So I applied and, you know, I think a day later, I got an email saying, you know, you should come in for an interview. So I go in and, you know, go up to the fifth floor in Times Square. And it, I was already just a little bit, um, you know, unsure about this whole thing because on the website, they're very vague, you know, like how all of these companies, if you look up their website and you try to read their about section, you know, you, you're not really going to get at what they actually do. They, they have a lot of phrases and, you know, things like that, but they don't, they don't talk specifically about what they do. And, you know, there were even some typos or, you know, incorrect grammar in the biographies of the people. So it just seemed very, a uh, little bit unprofessional to me. And so I go in, but I needed a job. So I was going to try to kind of sell myself to them, you know, as they were doing the same thing to me. And I see on the wall for, for Andres, who was the manager, he had like uh, some soccer pictures and I played soccer, you know, I follow soccer. So I figured, okay, I'll try to relate with him about this. You know, you know how they, they teach you to do like the four Fs, you know, family, you know, what you care about, those kind of things. So I figured I'll try to do that in this situation and, you know, see where it can take me. So we had the interview you know, nothing really about the job, you know, just about me and my interests. And we talked about soccer and he invited me back for a second interview. And, you know, I left and I said, OK, you know, I'll come back on Monday and, you know, we'll go through it. But I guess the, the thing that stuck with me about that, you know, 10 minute conversation was he said, you know, you'll go out into the field for the second interview or we'll take you out. And I didn't really know what that meant because I thought, you know, this is just a marketing company. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll be in the office on computers, even though I didn't see any in the office. That was also uh, a red flag. You know, nobody, there were no computers, no technology, really. It was just people kind of standing up, talking, wearing suits. And so, you know, I go home and I, I tell my roommates, you know, OK, like this is what he said. You know, they're going to take me out. You know, what do you what do you think that means? And they said, oh, you know, they're just going to take you to lunch. You know, they're going to get to know you, that kind of thing. And so, so that was my expectation going into the second interview. And of course, for the second interview, it's, it's not that at all. You, um, that's when I met like my actual manager. His name is Dwayne. And he took me to, you know, just a random street in Brooklyn. And we were going to be selling uh, T-Mobile phones from 11 to 6. So just standing out there watching him. And they gave me, you know, a packet with, you know, about 40 pages, you know, just answering the same questions about myself over and over again, you know, what are my goals? What am I looking for? My strengths, my weaknesses, things that didn't really seem like they had anything to do with, you know, just talking to strangers and trying to get them to, um, you know, buy government phones. So I was uh, really taken aback by all of this. You know, I almost just walked out of the, the, the second interview, you know, after about, you know, four hours or so, I thought this is not, um, what I signed up for. I kind of even started to throw the interview a little bit because I just didn't want the job. You know, he would ask me, you know, 20 times, he would ask me over and over, you know, why, why should we choose you? Why are you a good candidate? And I remember, you know, one time towards the end, I just looked at him and said, you know, I, I don't know, because he had already asked me so many times, you know, what, what, what more am I going to say? And so we go back to the office after that. And I meet um, AJ, who was his partner, who was I believe the head of uh, WG marketing, because, you know, on their Instagram, it seems like he was kind of the, you know, the, the head owner of that, that company. And, you know, this was another red flag because he said, you know, you told Dwayne that, you know, your tutoring, it's not over yet. You know, you need a little bit more time before you can come work for us. And I told Dwayne that because of these red flags, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to commit to this, you know, today, I need to go home and think about this because this is, not what I thought, you know, this doesn't match my expectations. And so he said, you know, that the only reason we called you in for a second interview is because you said during the first one that you could start right away. So I thought, you know, that's kind of a weird uh, criteria for hiring, you know, that doesn't take any credentials, you know, you, you just yeah. have to be alive and available. So that also put me off a little bit. And, but he said, you know, okay, go home and we'll call you with a decision. And so I go home and I'm thinking the whole train ride home, you know, I, I hope I don't get this, you know, I really need a job, but 
you know, maybe with a little bit more time, I can find something, you know, just a little bit better. But they, they do call me and they said, you know, um, this was kind of, you know, smart how they sold this, but they said, you know, we don't really think that, you know, you don't have an experience in marketing, you know, we don't think you'd be a good fit, but Dwayne really wants you, you know, Dwayne really fought for you. And I mean, I see that now they did this, you know, so that I would be loyal to Dwayne, who was my interviewer and my manager. Yeah. And, you know, they, they said, um, you know, it's between you and a marketing student from Columbia, you know, why should we pick you? And I mean, of course, you know, that's completely not true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, of, of course that's not true. But again, I just said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have any experience in this, but uh, I tried to kind of work the whole student mentality thing mm -hmm. that they really push. You know, I tried to just say, okay, I, you know, I, I don't know anything, but I'm willing to learn. And I even tried to say, well, I have to do this babysitting thing or this tutoring and babysitting, you know, I need a couple of days. And they, they were like, okay, that's fine. Like, we'll work with you. Like you can compromise with us. Right. You know, they really kind of pushed me to do it. So in the end, I just said, okay, I'll, I'll try it out. And that's, that's kind of, you know, where it started from, but the whole, you know, interview process and things, um, it never really felt right with me. And, you know, that's even kind of why I had to say, you know, I, I, I have to take a couple of days because I didn't want to commit just then because it didn't feel right really at all. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely fear of loss the hell out of you. It sounds like, um, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that's the common, that's one of those, uh, Fuji impulse factors. Fear of loss is, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're dangling it in front of you. You applied for this. That must mean you need a job. Uh, but you know, it's between you and this other guy. We don't, you probably don't want to lose out. You know, we need a decision yeah. now. And that's why they do that. Everything is impulsive because the more yeah, you of think course, about it, they don't it, want you to think about it. It's exactly. Crazy. Cause you, like you just said, you felt it's going on. I, I don't know if I've ever been to a job interview where on the way home, I'm thinking, I really hope I don't. I really, this yeah, job. <laughs> that, again, yeah, of course. I'm just thinking in my head. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't have any problem telling them, you know, no, obviously, because I, I stopped working there very fast, but I didn't want to have to deal with it. I was just, you know, this whole thing was a, a mistake. You know, I would just like to move on from here, but yeah. you know, they really, you know, at every instance on that phone call, when I tried to kind of hint, you know, maybe you should go at the other guy without, you know, outright saying it, they, they were like, you know, no, no. And then in the end, you know, they even got pretty firm and were like, you see that we're compromising with everything you're saying, right? Like you can do this, you know, we we're doing it for you. And I, I had nothing left at that point. So. Yeah. They, uh, they sound a little desperate, honestly. Yeah, I think, so I, I, think so. I wonder if, uh, if, if they're going through or we're going through a dry spell of recruiting there. Cause, uh, that sound usually, you know, you want to be really indifferent, uh, to use another of the Fuji factors, but yeah, yeah it sounds like, uh, quite a bit of desperation there. And, you know, just to review, you did go over a few red flags that anyone who's familiar with these operations will know, but they're very important for, uh, you know, fresh job seekers to be on the lookout for. So that's just the job title, entry level marketing rep. Now, of course, they're going to call it a thousand other things to get more people in, but right. anytime you hear entry level marketing in the same sentence, Right. This is something you have to consider. It doesn't mean it necessarily will be, but combined with the other things, like you said, vague websites. Yeah. I don't, I can't recall a job I've worked anywhere where I didn't go in, even to the interview. I'm not even talking about day one, but just the interview, knowing exactly, or at least roundaboutly, what my job duties were going to be. Right. And here, or just what the company know. does in general, you know, not exactly. even you, but the overall company, you know, what service do they provide to people? You know, there's one quote that I remember from the website that now is just funny to me. You know, they said, we do what others won't to achieve what others can't. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, that's a nice phrase, I guess. But what does that really mean? You know, doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it doesn't mean, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Specific phrases like um, I'm, I'm always... To me, a dead giveaway is we work with Fortune 500 companies because they yeah, always yeah. have that on there. Yeah. A lot of buzzwords. And then you had meant, of course, the word field. You know, if anyone says well, we're going to send you out to the field for round two. Yeah. Um, a lot of relationship building. So even from the interview, you know, you, you um, Andres had, mm -hmm. like you said, soccer photos, which is an interest of yours. And they, they mm -hmm. really try to pick out interests, man. They really try yeah. to build that relationship. 
Yeah, like they would lie to me point. about like my, you know, relating to my interests. You know, they, I would, they, of course, they ask you all these questions. So then you tell them what you like. And, you know, I could just tell that they were not, they would pretend to be interested or pretend to know what I was talking about. But, you know, if, if you talk to anybody and they, you know, clearly don't really know, you can kind of pick up on it. Mm -hmm. And I guess another, um, like, catch word in the description that would be a red flag is, and it was really the case for, for It's Your Wheelhouse. You know, they really, uh, you know, honed in on this. And this is also why I talked about soccer is because they said, uh, we're looking for sports minded people, you know, competitive mm -hmm. people. Uh, they just talked about sports a lot, you know, putting it into that context. Yeah. yeah. And some of the people who I met, um, you know, when they make you do the networking or, you know, the after hours, you have to go to the bar and, you know, network up and that sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, a lot of those people, when I would talk to them, they also came from uh, sports backgrounds. You know, they played sports in college and, sure. you know, needed something and then they found this. So, um, yeah, if that's in the description, you know, I, I would assume that this is one of those companies because it's it's not necessarily inappropriate to write that, but it, it's right. a bit unprofessional. Yeah, and some will go go far beyond. I don't know about these companies, but I know some I've seen will even advertise as a position sports marketing, which there's yeah, nothing. Yeah, sports and events, yeah. So you were only there for a week. But you you remember the campaign. So I, I just want to know a little bit about what impression do you have of the of the, the phone campaign? Because like you said, this was you were in Brooklyn. Yeah. You were selling the 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 government lifeline uh, phones. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So tell me a little bit about this. Do you feel like this is a worthwhile program? What's the problem? You know, why are we and so many other people that share their stories with me, why should we be concerned about this when it sounds like it's a good thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, sounds, it sounds like a good thing. I mean, the, the way that Dwayne kind of pitched it to me was he was saying, you know, the, the, government, the purpose of the government program, you know, with these free phones is that, you know, nowadays it's, it's hard to get a job, you know, for lower income people if they don't have, um, you know, access to the internet, you know, you, you do all your applications to the internet and things like that. So it's a way to kind of, you know, get, um, you know, get them some accessibility to, to getting jobs and things like that, but just kind of strange or, or troubling to me that, you know, um, this government program, Lifeline, it's just, um, I guess it was started in the Reagan era, but really revived during, revived during the Obama era. And, you know, we'd even have to, you know, part of the pitch was to call them Obama phones. You know, that was like a, a little tagline, you know, during the uh, Obama presidency. So that's, you know, what we would call them when we talk to people on the street, you know, we would say, uh, you know, those Obama phones, like we, we have them here, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's just uh, troubling that a government program that was started a while back and then, you know, kind of revived um, about a decade or so ago has just kind of, I guess nobody's watching it and it's just been funneled into this whole um, multi-level marketing you know, circus that's going on. You know, I, I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, nobody who isn't involved in this thing would know about that or, or think about it, but it doesn't seem like a, a productive thing. You know, somebody should kind of take control of it because it also is providing a lot of these companies like It's Your Wheelhouse, um, you know, with clients or with jobs, you know, and it, of course it would be better if the, these companies weren't able to, to prey on people. Yeah. So okay, it, it's part of the government lifeline program. So in terms of, of the pitch and how this was advert or how you advertised this, what did, what, what did the, the, your clients or your customers, what criteria did they have to meet? Mm. What, how, did they have to pay anything? And ultimately okay, yeah, how yeah. is this, how did you all make money off this? Yeah, so I mean, the, the thing is that for, for the customers, it's actually not really a bad deal. So you have to qualify for some government assistance programs. So food stamps or Section 8 housing or Medicaid or, you know, any any kind of um, government issued, you know, subsidiary funding that you receive, you can qualify and you pay fifty five dollars and you get the phone and it has, you know, a good amount of gigabytes and there's no monthly bills. So, you know, you pay fifty dollars for an Android T-Mobile phone and you have no monthly bills and, you know, you get to use it for a long time. It's unlimited texting. You know, that, that's a pretty good deal. You know, I, those people, they, don't, they weren't necessarily getting ripped off. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem, you know, selling it to them in that sense. But it's just more the tactics. 
and the way that you have to lie to them, you know, you don't, you're not supposed to tell them that they have to pay the $55 until the very end. You know, that's the last thing that you say, you know, you make them go through the whole registration process. You have to pretend to be their friend for, you know, 10 minutes while they're standing there and they think they're getting a free phone, you know, and so many times, you know, you say it at the end and they give you like a look of, you know, I can't believe that you just wasted my time like this. You know, you have to start out with this. You know, sometimes people would even say, you know, it's, it's wrong that, that you didn't tell me this in the beginning. So, but, but what they're actually getting, you know, isn't a faulty product or anything, you know, it's a, it's a good phone for a low price, but just the tactics that um, wheelhouse kind of made you employ to get these people to come over and, you know, spend their money when maybe they don't even need it. Maybe they already have a phone, but they do qualify. So you have to pressure them. You know, those mm -hmm. are, you know, that that's just wrong. So it's sleazy. It's sleazy sales. Yeah, tactics. yeah, it, yeah. It's been incredibly sleazy. One of your main suspicions that you talked about were uh, tax forms. Yeah. And so was so number one. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What you discovered, and number two, did this have a a major role into why you ended up leaving so quickly? Yeah. So that that's the interesting thing is that the the tax form. Um, you know, issue was actually the first thing that made me do more research online about this whole thing. You know, I didn't really, I didn't look, I didn't, I, that Reddit post was like the first thing that I saw, you know, the one that you mentioned about yeah. the address, but I didn't see it, you know, when I was applying or after the interviews, you know, it was only after I started working there. So basically, I guess this whole time, because of the red flags about the office that I said, I knew that something about the way that they were portraying their money supply was not accurate because it, nothing lined up in the sense of how much or how little money that they actually had. So I knew that there had to be a parent company. You know, I knew it wasn't just, it's your wheelhouse, you know, going alone. That, that didn't make any sense based on how they presented themselves. So I didn't want to ask as well because I figured that would be awkward. So I was just kind of waiting to see, you know, when am I going to get to see the name of the parent company? Because then I can do more research. Because if you just look up, it's your wheelhouse online, there's no information other than the website. So when, uh, you know, the first day that I actually got hired, you know, I started working, they gave me the form that I assume that everybody gets where you, you know, it's basically the contract, you know, that you're going to start working. And they had the, mar the market value incorporated logo at the top. So I said to myself, you know, okay, you know, this is it. Uh, I have to remember this because I'm going to go home and look it up. You know, this is the head company that I've been waiting to see. And part of the form was, um, you know, twofold basically saying that um, the first one was um, you, you can't go um, quit this job and then go start working for another company and tell them what we taught you here. You know, that was the first part of it. But then the second part was you can quit at any time. You know, you don't have to give us two weeks and we can fire you at any time. You don't have to give us two weeks. So that's, that's what I signed. I said, okay. And then a couple of days later, I got an email. Well, I had actually forgotten the name of Market Value Incorporated. So I got home and I was going to look it up and I couldn't remember because I just saw it on this piece of paper that, you know, they make you sign it in two minutes and give it back. You can barely read it. And but the email that I got was to kind of put in my information, you know, my Social Security, you know, get registered, you know, with Market Value Incorporated and Lifeline, I believe, because you have to because it's through the Lifeline program. And so then I was able to look up Market Value Incorporated and then I was able to kind of see, OK, what I actually signed with the, you know, two weeks um, thing is that you're you're basically an entrepreneur you know you're you're not a real employee of the company that's why they're able to not pay you minimum wage that's why there's no overtime laws with this whole thing you know they call you to come in and you work 10 11 hour days and you just make commission if you don't sell anything you don't sell anything you know it's free labor in that sense so that kind of really put me off i said okay well what's a 1099 tax form because i'm only used to the other ones you know the uh, 270, I believe, you know, if you're a real employee and doing the research about the 1099, I found out that, you know, that's what you fill out if you have a small business or you're an entrepreneur and you're going to get taxed a lot more because you're essentially self-employed from that standpoint. And so then I started doing the math and I said, OK, let's say I make the 80K that they're promising me. You know, I let's even go with their numbers. If I have to fill out this tax form and the fact that they don't, well, I guess we we'll, we we'll pause and have a little um, intro here, but you know, a lot of your videos in other places, you know, sometimes they help pay for people's gas. 
and things like that. But in New York City, you know, you don't drive a car. So you take the subway. So I started doing the math, you know, that's four subway trips every day that I have to pay for, plus lunch, plus the money that from this 1099 tax form that they're going to take out of, let's say, 80, 60K. You know, after that's done, you're not making, you're making less than half of that. You know, you're not making any money and you're working 10 hour days, you know, doing uh, dehumanizing work and you have to even hang out with these people after work and, you know, you, you don't see your family, you don't see anybody that you know. So it just very clearly became, this is not worth it. You know, before I even knew about the, the whole kind of pyramid structure and how all of these companies are all over America, you know, before I even did that research, just financially doing the math, I could see this is not what it was positioned. And it all kind of started with the, the tax form and the fact that they, you know, you're not, a, you're not technically or legally uh, a real employee by this company. So they don't have, they don't have to give you any benefits and you don't have any uh, protections. I know there, there have been a lot of questions raised about um, not in other videos and just by people um, who I've talked to about taxes and about, well, how can these companies get away with this uh, by not paying? And like you said, 10, 11 hour days, 80 hour weeks, and basically nothing to show for it. And, you know, no. I'm, uh, and I'm by no means a tax expert or expert on tax law, no, but I think, yeah. yeah, I think you definitely, uh, that, that's a really good thing to look at is you, you got to know a little bit about, uh, you know, the specific forms. And, you know, where yeah. I, when I was in, I was in smart circle. So I know that we're talking about, um, you know, credit code today. Um, but when I was in smart circle, and I think a lot of smart circle companies do this is that they'll do a, a minimum wage as kind of like a safety net. And I was, you know, I got a W2 every year. Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, different. I know we, we, we kind of loop Credico and, and smart circle and Sidcore, all these companies together. There are some differences, you know, the, you are going to no, find some course. differences, but they do tend to operate the same way. I'm, I'm curious then after, especially now since you said how hard they fought for you to get this job, mm. what was the whole process of you just quitting after a week and a half? Did you just not come back? Did you tell anybody? Did they try to keep you? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, so it was in the, it was in the morning, you know, when I got that email and I got the, you know, kind of started doing the math, the tax thing. And then that was the first thing where I was like, you know, well, this isn't worth it then, you know, I make $30,000 a year to, to give away my life. I mean, the, this isn't going anywhere. I don't want to own my own business or anything like that. You know, that um, didn't motivate me. You know, I don't want to be an owner of a, a lifeline subsidiary. So, but after that, because um, I, I had something then in writing to show what they presented to me is not the case. So then once you have something like that, you know, you have math that you can't deny I think it becomes easier to kind of say, okay, well, I need to find out what else is in writing that they can't get around or what else is, you know, actually true that uh, based on other people's experiences. So that morning, you know, after I figured that out, I just started doing a lot of research. That's when I found that Reddit post that we talked about. That's when I found your documentary and watched, you know, your documentary. And I, I think I wasn't really surprised because like I said, you know, this whole time, there's little red flags that are popping up, things that don't make sense, but none of it fit together. But then when it fit together, you know, watching your, your Smart Circle documentary, like I, I wasn't surprised, but I was really shocked. You know, it really just took me back, just really stunted me. I was like, wow, you know, I really stepped in this whole underworld of, you know, just really sleazy, slimy stuff. And I did just kept doing more research, trying to find out as much as I could about this this whole thing, you know, during that day, and I was supposed to go in at night, you know, for, for more training, but uh, it just kind of shocked me so much that I was like, you know, there's, there's no way that this can, can go on for me, you know, I just want it to be over. And uh, I really thought about, you know, should I go in and tell them this, but I knew that they were just going to try to talk me out of it or anything that I said, they were going to um, deflect basically, because that, that's exactly what they do. So I, I didn't have any problems about it from this sense because I, I figured you know they, they just lied to me about this whole thing so I just sent them a text you know I wasn't anything nasty you know I didn't even really talk about this whole thing I just said you know that this isn't for me like I'm I tried to call they didn't pick up so I just sent a text never got a response which is perfectly fine with me 
and that was it. You know, it, it cut the cord. So I just tried to get out of there as, as fast as possible. I know you mentioned earlier in passing that your parents have real legitimate marketing experience. Yeah. Did you ever have a discussion with them about what you were going to be doing or anything like that with them? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess the the one who I talked about it the most with initially was my my stepdad and he does um, mar marketing and advertising. And he kind of told me from the very beginning, you know, this is going to be a waste of your time and money. You know, just I know that you really need a job right now, but just do something else. Like, and my my feeling about it and what I told him was, you know, I, I hear you, you know, totally possible. I'm not, I'm not totally committed to this, but just give me a couple of days to feel it out because the pieces, whether they're right or wrong, they haven't really fit together for me yet. You know, I have impressions, but I don't really know what's going on here yet. You know, I'm not going to just jump out of it right now. You know, give me a little bit of time to figure it out. So that that's what I did. You know, I took a couple more days. Every day I went in, you know, you notice things and you just try to get more and more information. And then once I was able to finally get the, the market value incorporated information, that kind of unlocked everything to, you know, find the resources that are out there to help you to put this together. But yeah, from the beginning, you know, he kind of told me, you know, this is a, a scam, basically, you, you shouldn't do this. And then I, after I quit, you know, I told him, you know, you were right. And he just said, you know, I'm glad you figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, and I think you can look back on it now and think, well, a week and a half, um, at least I'm well informed now, right? I'm, I'm educated yeah. about this. And, uh, and you definitely had your suspicions from the, from the beginning. And I think that speaks volumes because we all have this intuition. And if something just doesn't seem right, you did the right thing. You did research. And that is really the only way that people are going to save themselves from this is if they yeah. pay attention to their intuition that something's not right here. I don't know what it is, but let's see if we can figure it out. And you took the steps necessary to, to figure it out. Did Credico, the name Credico ever come up at all? Oh, no. I didn't even figure out that it was connected to Credico until like a, a good amount of weeks later because I was looking at the Instagrams of the people I worked with and I saw in Dwayne, you know, my managed Instagram that he was at the, the Credico offices. Mm -hmm. And then I was looking at some of the other Instagrams and saw that, you know, like Andres and these, these people had also been at the Credico offices or gala dinners and things mm -hmm. like that. And then that's how I was able to figure it out and, you know, put Rap Diaz together with it. But no, nothing about Credico kind of ever, ever came up. Mm -hmm. And that's not surprising. No, um, yeah, of course, we, they never talk about it. For anyone who uh, either just stumbled upon this video or for the, the thousands of people who watch every one of these videos that comes out, if you have not yet looked up, there is a great short film on YouTube called The Sweatshop of Wall Street. And usually, yeah. usually the slave circle comes up in recommendations for The Sweatshop of Wall Street. If you have not taken a look at that yet, like I said, it's only 18 minutes. Take a look at it because literally what Amani is talking about in the interview yeah. today is what that film is about. It's about selling phones and the whole direct sales right there in New York City, yeah. um, right where Amani was, uh, was working. And as of as of the day I'm looking at this, it only has 33,000 views, which uh, I'm a wow. little surprised about. So if, if there's any way we can get those views up so more people can, can see that, that would be awesome because that is literally exactly what you what you experienced yeah you that documentary it. is good too because it also you know like maybe one third of it is focusing on like the office environment mm -hmm. you know in that documentary it was definitely more extreme than anything i saw but just yeah. the whole kind of juice culture and you know you have to spend all your time here and after hours we're going to go and hang out and everything like that i mean that was really a red flag to me or just something that i didn't want because you know i have no problem being friendly with my coworkers and things like that. But at the same time, you know, I have a life outside of work. I have interests outside of work that, you know, I, I wasn't willing to sacrifice to, you know, commit my whole life to being a member of this team that just sells phones, you sure. know, that, that, that didn't sound very appealing to me. So, you know, even from the beginning as well, you know, that was something that I thought, you know, the, this could be a problem because the, they kept asking me to come to these things that were, you know, extra or at night or after work, you know, after you've already spent 10 hours, you know, standing in the field and it didn't seem necessary for what we were doing. You know, it seemed very extra, you know, it's just all of those kind of things are, you know, also maybe things to look out for because good to pay attention when they're overselling it to you. There were, there were a couple of things like that to me as well. Like, 
Duane would always talk about how much money he was making or how much money the office was making. And he would do it over and over. And I really remember there was one time in particular where he just said, you know, something like, yeah, like we're, we're just making stupid money. And it was just the way he said it. And I, I thought to myself, you know, you're overdoing it now. You know, I hear you. Okay, you're making money. Okay, you know, this is before I knew any of the real information, but just in his tone and the way he kept doing it, you're just overselling it. You know, if, if somebody keeps talking about how much money they're making after they've already told you and all of these things, you know, it's, it's probably not the truth because they don't have to keep reiterating, reiterating it to you. They don't have to keep, you know, trying to get you to believe something that, you know, should just be, should just, you know, you should naturally understand or tell from how they carry themselves, you know, this person is successful. Like we were talking about with, you know, in, information versus intuition, mm -hmm. because, you know, for me personally, and for, you know, I've seen your videos, the people that come on your, your videos, and really anyone who has to get involved in this, because it's not really, nobody grows up wanting to do this, it's not a totally desirable thing. So I understand, you know, for me personally, as well, that there is some kind of desperation when you get into these situations, you know, you need a job, you need money, they're kind of promising you that if you stay on this path, and you work there will be something at the end for you, or, you know, you'll, you'll have success this way. And it can be kind of seems like, okay, I'll take this risk, even though I'm unsure. But I don't know, the thing that really kind of cuts through that or can help bring clarity is the information. So I would just recommend, you know, even if you, you just started working there, you've worked there for a long time, and you don't even, let's say you don't even dislike it, you know, you like the people you work with, you are making a little bit of money or something, you should still just seek out the information, because that will kind of tell you, what the deal is, and it will allow you to kind of see it for yourself. You don't have to rely on, you know, people at the office telling you things over and over again. You know, you'll, you'll get the, the, the proper information.